God bless. Good evening. Christ is risen. I hope you all are well. Good to see you. Sorry we're a day late. Usually Tuesday evenings we're here with you, but uh, something came up. We had to move it to Wednesday, and unfortunately we probably lost a few people, but maybe we gained some. I don't know. Maybe we'll do a poll tonight to see if Wednesdays work for you all. But uh, normally Tuesdays, glad you're here with us. Uh, we're going to be looking tonight at the Psalm of Psalms. If you look at the divine services, you'll see just how ubiquitous it is and how important it is in our spiritual life. Psalm 50 or 51, if you're a Protestant, we're following the Septuagint. We'll talk about that in a moment. But glad you're all here. Everybody can hear me, see me. And we're not having any issues with our sound or uh, images, I'm, ass I'm assuming. Let me know. Uh, right now, we're coming on my end through the new updated version of Crowdcast, and it looks pretty good. I have not really used it to date, but it seems like it's pretty good. There's an echo. Hmm. That's strange. Why would there be an echo? I don't have my I don't have um, my micro my speaker on. Does everybody else have an echo as well? Let me know. Maybe it just kitty key, key. Let me know if everybody else has an echo. I don't I'm not sure what we can do about it. I haven't changed a thing in my setup here. Not for me. Sounds okay here. Everything looks good. Okay. So that means it's a local problem for you, Kitty Aki. Check it out. All right. Let's jump into the prayers as usual. Thank you, Maria, Maria, Elias, Demetrios, Tamara. Welcome, everybody. Michael, God bless. Very good. All right, Paisios. Good. Let's jump into it. We'll say our prayers as usual, and we'll be right back. Coming up now on the Feast of Ascension and Pentecost, not far away. And it's exciting, one of my favorite times of the year. We'll be right back after the prayers. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind with the pure light of the divine knowledge. And open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of the gospel teaching. Implant us also fear of thy blessed commandments to trample down all carnal desires. We may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things as are well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God. Unto thee we ascribe glory, together with our Father, whom ever lasts, the Holy Good and Life creating Spirit, will now endeavor and unto ages of ages. Amen. <laughs> O pan so fus tu salis anadixas cata pemsas aftis to pnevma to aion ke di afton tini kumeni saigi nevsas Philanthrope doxa si. Christos anesti eg necron thanaton thanaton pan Tisas kentisen tis mi masi zoi harisa amenos. Amen. All right. So tonight, again, we're looking at Psalm 50. We have a few commentaries in front of us. Let me turn that down again. I don't know why that goes up automatically. It gets really in my face. Uh, and we're going to be basing most of our discussion tonight of this psalm on the commentary 
that we have from St. Athanasius the Great. Now, there's also commentary from other church fathers, uh, and I, you know, we could revisit this. I actually want to obtain the commentary of Elder Athanasius de Linnaeus at some point, and we may revisit this, which I I have in Greece, but I don't have it in America, unfortunately. It's one of the problems with my uh, situation coming over from the from Greece is that, unfortunately, I had to leave in Greece a very hefty portion of my library, and that makes things a little more difficult. But we do have the commentary here of our Father among the Saints, Athanasius, the Great, St. Athanasius the Great, and it's in Greek, and I've translated the portions that I want to talk about into English. We'll put it on the screen in a minute. We also have the great uh, extensive commentary on the Psalms by uh, Blessed Augustine. Uh, we may make use of that uh, a bit. And then uh, we will also talk a little bit from our various experiences over the years drawing from the living tradition that comes down to us. All right. So if everybody's hearing us, we're going to continue. We'll put on the screen here the tonight's uh, PDF, which we'll make available in Patreon uh, not long from now. But it's pretty pretty straightforward. But if you... You want to go further, go revisit it. You'll have that in Patreon later tonight. So tonight, uh, you can see this beautiful image of the prophet David being visited. I'm sorry, the prophet and King David being visited, visited by Pro prophet Nathan and being basically brought to his senses for the sins that he had committed. And then you see him repenting, uh, I think, the woman here is not a woman, actually. It's metania. It's repentance itself. You can see it up here in the corner of metania. Metania is represented here by this um, female, the prophet in the middle, Nathan, and then prophet David, uh, who is basically coming to his senses and, and repenting. So that's a very nice icon we found, which helps us kind of see before we get into the text itself. Now we're going to look at the Greek text a little bit, the English text. We'll come back and visit it throughout the analysis and and then uh, look it up, look for your questions. Now, uh, we probably, I'm not going to read this to you. It's pretty extensive. I don't know if there's such, there's, it's not and then such the import that it does when you're looking at the book of Revelation, which is also smaller text, but also we're looking at a very detailed analysis of every word. I don't think this is as important, but we will occasionally come back and look at a few key words. For instance, one of the key words here is in verse 14 here. Apodos mitina galia sinto sitiriosu ke pnevmati Igemoniko uh, is an interesting word. We'll talk about that and and the, uh, uh, the 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 unfortunate part about the commentary of Saint Athanasius is that he actually doesn't cover. It just skipped for some reason. I don't know if it's lost to the manuscript. It seems like probably it's lost because I can't imagine him skipping it intentionally. But literally, he goes from you can see here the English version from Holy Transfiguration Monastery. By the way, in case you don't, you're new to Orthodox, you haven't been around. The only one that I would wholeheartedly embrace in terms of the Psalms translation of the Psalms at this point, I know there are other uh, other versions, and I know that there's some people who really make a claim for another version, which I'm not familiar with. But the tried, old, established version of the Psalms in English, in use liturgically in many. Uh, including the Antiochian diocese and and the Greek and mu much of the Greek Church is the one from Holy Transfiguration Monastery in Boston. It was, I think, the first version made in the seventies or early eighties, and it's more or less used in the Russian Church abroad. But they've made changes; they have their own version. But really, that was used for the longest time, also I think, in the Russian Church abroad. So it's kind of the old established version, and this is what we're going to be using. What we use. It's also very convenient because it's in the 
probably the most well-known prayer book, at least was in my day in the 90s when I was coming to the church, 1993. Uh, the Little Blue Prayer Book from Holy Trinity Monastery, the prayer book uh, that is the most conducive if you're in the Greek chanting tradition, right? Because it's able you're able to chant it according to the Byzantine chant. So the blue, the little blue prayer book. Uh, I don't see any commentary activity, and usually that could mean that we've got issues. Just give me a shout out that everything's good, uh, but it doesn't need to be many people, just one, because sometimes things freeze up and I don't get wind of it. Uh, so this is the Holy Church Generation Monastery version. Uh, we're going to be doing I will read this. And we'll read the description and the text, and then we'll begin the commentary. For the end, the Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him, when he went into Bersebi, there's various translations of the name of the wife of Uriah or Urias. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy great mercy and according to the multitude of thy compassions, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my iniquity and my sin is ever before me. Against thee only have I sinned and done this evil before thee, that thou mightest be justified in thy words and prevail when thou art judged. But behold, I was conceived in iniquities and in sins that my mother bare me. But behold, thou hast loved truth, the hidden and secret things of thy wisdom as thou made manifest unto me. upon thine altar. Mm. So you guys did not hear the psalm then. Uh, my cam, my, my, that's very strange. My, uh, my microphone was shown as working this whole time. That's very strange. Okay, so you did not hear the psalm then. I got off. I got off in order for everybody to see the screen better, and it shows my microphone is working. That's the strange thing. So I was assume I assumed that you had the you you heard everything. Very strange. Nop or nope, Elena? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. You did hear some of it though, right? You did hear you did hear most of it. All right. Well, we won't read it again, but. We'll come back to it as we go through the, uh, it's strange. Yeah, you all know it. All right. So I'm not going to go off screen again, but, it, you know, I did that because I'm looking at my microphone. It's showing that it's working. I don't know why. That's very strange. Let's go on to the, to the, to the introduction. Now, this psalm is read almost daily, several times a day, not almost daily, several times a day it's read almost in every service. So in Orthros, we read it, and we chant it on Sundays. You heard the chanting before. That's from the Sunday uh, the uh, Orthros, where we chant the, the uh, psalm. 
Of course, we read it at Compline every night. We read it during the supplication services, whether they be whatever supplication service it might be. We read it during the morning prayers and the unction service. We read it at the um, blessing of the small blessing of the waters, and the priest reads or you know under under his breath reads says the I shouldn't say reads says the fiftieth psalm during the sensing before the great entrance. So there's no other psalm that is said so much. Right? There's no other psalm that is said so often. And so this is obviously a very important psalm. Now, the original setting and composition is by the prophet David, the King David. And let's say a word about this because it's really important, the context. Uh, and the interpretation by St. Athanasius really does look at the context pretty thoroughly, uh, whereas we're often saying it without any thought of the context. I'm sure most of us have maybe haven't even considered the context of the psalm. Obviously, the Psalms become a universal expression for everyone. And in many ways, this is a universal expression of the church about repentance, about the need for repentance and how we repent. It becomes now a model of repentance for all of us. So the context is the King David and his sins. Now, we all know about King David. I think everybody knows about the story of David and Goliath a young shepherd boy, and he is not known, to, obviously, as a young shepherd boy to be a great warrior, in, but in spite of it all, because God wants to show forth his power, this young boy joins them on the, on the battleground, kills the great giant that everybody was afraid of, Goliath, with his slingshot. Who would have thought that that would have been possible? David was the youngest of eight brothers. And no one ever thought that he would be king because he's the youngest for one reason, right? He was not expected to be king. And his brothers were great soldiers, but he was a simple shepherd man. But he was favored by King Saul and was good friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. Saul became paranoid, however, that David might one day take his throne. He had some reasons to believe that. And Saul turned on David. But God's providence, everything is arranged for the salvation of the people of God so they might bring forth eventually the Theotokos. He becomes the king after Saul and his son are killed in battle. And King David, of course, had the favor of God and of his fellow men. He was very gifted. He had many gifts from God. He was a very powerful king. But unfortunately, in spite of that, passions tend to make one less than wise, if not illogical. He's not satisfied with his power and his place and all the rest. And upon seeing a beautiful woman, usually in English we call her Beth Bathsheba, if I'm saying it right, uh, and She's sunbathed in on the roof of her house, and from the palace he looks out and sees her, and he's he's overcome with lust. And of course, as the king, he feels all powerful. He can take matters into his hands, and he falls into great sin, adultery, with this beautiful woman who's married to a man by the name of Uriah or Urias, and. She becomes pregnant. David has to deal with this quote unquote problem. He has to solve this problem. And how is he going to solve the problem? Well, very now in the entirely in the grips of sin and and cunningness, he sends this soldier, this this young man to battle, and he dies in battle. And now he can take. Bathsheba is his wife, and they have a son, and yet the story is not over. This is probably not an unlikely or unheard of story in one way or another of sin and deception and murder and uh, adultery among the powerful of the world. 
And in the ancient world, certainly the kings are known for their licentiousness and their having many wives and all the rest in his day. So the Lord sends, however, his prophet to bring David to repentance and then set up this man's repentance as a model for all of Israel and all of the Christian world for thousands of years. And in Samuel, 2 Samuel, we read, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. The Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup. It lay in his bosom and was under him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was to come. And David's anger when he heard this was greatly kindled against the man. And he sees this, unjust, this injustice and he's very angry. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. So he brings David to himself. This is one of the most important, the very basis, the, the basics, uh, the basis and the and the the, the foundation, I should say, of everyone's repentance what is it to come to oneself to be brought to epignosi knowledge of one's own state one's own sin one's own inner uh duplicitness and hypocrisy you see this in the prodigal son you see this in every story of repentance they have they have to come at this moment at some moment to themselves and realize how far they are from the father's house, how they've sinned and have been alienated. They need to come out of the delusion. They're truly in delusion. They're in plani, prelest. The proud man is always in delusion. The humble man is in reality. So he is this man because David had taken the wife of Uriah and had had Uriah killed. After Nathan left, David was devastated and exceedingly humbled. He came to himself, realized the gravity of his transgression, and turned to the Lord in repentance. And he confesses his two crimes, the murder of Uriah and the adultery of Bathsheba. It exemplifies to all men repentance as a way to salvation, as a way to continually be victorious over the enemy. So whoever achieves repentance continually is victorious over the one that is ceaselessly fighting against him. Notice that the repentance is understood to be continuous. Continuous. This is so important. We don't even know what repentance is, most of us, right? We don't understand what it means to repent. If we talk about repentance, we'll come and see that... We probably, some of us, maybe all of us, maybe most of us, I don't know, is, sorry about that, is under the delusion, under the influence of the world and of the, the Protestant West, that uh, I don't know, I can't really, let me see if I can get rid of that by getting rid of this app. Um, I want to get rid of this app, but so we don't have that again. It, 
And that is this idea, at least partially among Protestants, the idea that we have one major repentance that we go through, one major turn, one major confession of faith, and then we're fine, and then we're good to go. We, we're, we're now, as it were, immutable. It's immutable, we're unshakable, we're established, and, and we are on the path of salvation. But in the Greek, St. Athanasius says, Ogar taftinai meleton ke katorthon via pandos, via pandos, to become forever victorious, nikitis tuai prospaleondas. So let me see if I can get this in a good, I'm going to retranslate this into English. Here's the modern Greek for all of you know Greek. Opus di ladim etap melatai pandote. Ai, ai means always to study, always to reflect. Kepitichani uh, sinekos, in other words, he has continuous uh, success in repentance. He is victorious without end with that one who is struggling against him. All right, so that, if we go back to the English translation, he achieves repentance continually. He's constantly studying, right? And he's constantly uh, successful in repentance. He's continually victorious over the one who's ceaselessly fighting against him, which, of course, is the enemy. But you see that this is, there's no sense here that this is something that happens once, twice, five times. It's a continuous present. And that's the way it is in Greek, right? He is he keeps on repenting. He, he keeps on perf being perfected. He doesn't say be perfect. He says keep on being perfect. And the idea is that you can lose it. The idea here, here is that it's not automatic. The idea here is it presupposes a continuous return, a continuous repentance. The image of the prodigal going back to the father is not, it, 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 it's to be understood that we're always on this path throughout our whole life. We arrive in the embrace of the father, but we can always fall away, right? It's a foretaste here. It's eternally secure there. This is very different than the various soteriologies offered by the heterodox. And it's that those soteriologies are extremely legalistic, moralistic, uh, and they do not understand the dynamic nature of the free will of the human being, that he can turn away at any moment and go back to the pit. And we do, unfortunately, and that's why repentance is again and again. What are they doing in that monastery, they said the monk? What are you doing over there? We're getting, We're falling down and getting up. See that? It's not we fell down and we got up. We're falling down and we're getting up. We're falling down and we're getting up. For all of you out there who say, I never can't achieve it. I don't. Somebody came to talk to me recently and they said, same things, Father. I got the same things to tell you. I said, brother, don't forget that the holiness is in the struggle. It's not in the achievement only. It's in the struggle. And the achievement is going to be increased and and solidified by the one who crowns he crowns he gives he 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 judges when we're able and ready we've graduated in deep repentance to start to see the fruits of repentance right so people very important to understand that repentance is continual repentance is every day repentance is a way of life Repentance is a stance that we have. It's not a it's not a move. It's not a one time, five times, ten times, fifty times. No, it's a way of of living, a way of thinking about our life that we're constantly returning, and we're going deeper. And it's an endless deepening, right? It's an endless deepening, really. Uh, it has no end, even into eternity. All right, so let's go on here and let's look at the first line. Have mercy on me, O God according to thy great mercy. All of what we're going to read here, uh, the text you see in front of you is a translation of the commentary of St. Athanasius the Great on the Psalms. And if you have this book and want to know what it is, this is the Apandata Erga, all of the works of St. Athanasius the Great. This is volume six. 
and this is his commentary, uh, volume two of Erem and Iftika. In other words, his commentary on uh, um, uh, the, the various scriptures and psalms and everything else. So this is volume two, and he's dealing on page 70, uh, 71 through page... 83, all right? So 71, 83 is what we're looking at in that volume six of the great, of the works of St. Athanasius the Great. And he begins, because the sin is great, he begs for God's great mercy. So have mercy on me, O God, according to that great mercy. Because why great mercy? Why is he saying that this, because it's a great sin, right? He's great. It's grave sin. I mean, the gravest of sins he's committed. And this is also providential because if he had committed a lesser sin, and then people fell into these greater sins, they would say, well, that's not applicable to me. I'm lost. You know, No, he allows this to go. He, of course, freely chooses the sin, and God allows him because he allows us. He's free to choose or not choose the Lord. He never forces anyone. And so he falls into the sin, and it's by God's providence, it's these grave sins so that no one could come later and say, well, I'm a worse sinner. It's very hard to imagine. Well, maybe if you kill 15 people, but really murder is murder is murder. The image of God is blotted out. It's a, an offense against the the, the prototype. Uh, and then he commits fornication. Uh, he shows himself to be unfaithful and to be lustful and to be a slave to the passions. And so this is the a great, great example of great mercy and great repentance. And he goes on, and according to the multitude of thy compassion, Blot out mine offenses. Only the compassion of God is truly the power to wash the hands of the murderer. Why do people walk around in this society with so many complexes, as, they, as the psychologists tell us, right? In other words, they're very... They're, there's, there's a... Um, excuse me. There's a, uh, a great many people who are very internally conflicted and under the weight of sin today because they do not understand that only when they return to God and he, in in the grace of repentance and confession, do they have the freedom from the weight and the consequences of those, those sins. Not always the consequences, but at least the guilt and the and the the weight of those sins. Sometimes we consequences continue. We have to live with those consequences, but they're a part of the pedagogy as well. But the inner man is freed from the weight and the the uh, separation from God. That's the most important, obviously. Uh, a few years of trial because of our sins is hardly anything before the eternity of communion with God. And so if we can achieve the communion with God again, be returned, sing Horacy, as I talked about uh, last um, on Monday night, it just aired last night. I don't know if everybody saw that, but there's a new, I think I posted it in Patreon, a new interview we did with uh, uh, the Royal Path, it's called. The Royal Path is a, um, a an online podcast uh, by Father Turbo and company. And we did that last night. Uh, and we talked a little about the question of what is what is repentance? And we talked a little about what is forgiveness. In Greek, we've said this before here, so it bears repeating. Synchordesy is to be in the same place. So is the word for forgiveness we have in Greek, right? So to be in the same place, to be in communion, right? Only, only, brothers and sisters, do we uh, achieve and come to a total wiping away and return to communion when we go back to the Lord himself in repentance and confession. And this is what the world desperately needs and is desperately missing and why you have people walking around under a great weight of sin. And this leads them to other sin because they fall into hopelessness, despair, suicide, and all the rest. And the gospel is this great, great news that you can be forgiven and restored to communion and have a deep 
and the lasting peace. Uh, and this should be the church's one of the main main works of the church. You know, when Elder Ephraim came over this this country, he essentially spent the next forty years confessing thousands of souls, thousands of people came under his epitrahili, and. Yeah. So, Maria, thank you so much for, for seeking to have respect. I appreciate that. Uh, I don't mind the comments I, unless people get way off topic. I don't really appreciate that because then it is a distraction for people. Uh, but as was said, you can turn off the comments if you like, and that way you're not distracted. Uh, but it should be we should have comments on topic. And then I've, I've, obviously it's good to take those comments if they're questions that I miss and put them in the question box. All right. So everybody uh, knows they can ask questions, right? Everybody knows where to get those questions. It, this is actually the uh, first time I'm using this live. The question and answer uh, is over here on the right, I see. And we have a question from Mary. We'll get to that a little bit later. And uh, so... That's great. Look at that. Uh, if you're in this new version, which I think most of you should be, right? You have these buttons on the right. Chat goes away immediately when you hit that question and answer. The questions uh, come up. Uh, we've got the polls on the right, and we've got the people on the right. So there you go. All right. Getting back to the text, uh, the... Uh, Let's go on to number three, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. And here the iniquity is referring to the murder. Cleanse me from my sin, which is referring to the adultery. And with sin, he means the adultery. Sin is the fall from the good, from, the, from communion. And iniquity is transgression of the divine law. So there is a... According to St. Athanasius the Great, there is a distinction here, which I, you know, I've been saying this psalm for 40 years. I don't know. And I never thought about the distinction. So it's very helpful. I don't think it's that important, but it's interesting that he does see this as a different thing. So anomia, iniquity, anomia, lawlessness, literally means lawlessness in Greek. Amartia is translated as sin, it's it's a missing of the mark. That's what it means in English anyway. In Greek, it's a little different, but in English, sin is the phrase used at the time when they translated the King James Bible for a missing of the target. If you're doing target practice or some kind of target, you're trying to hit the target, You when you don't hit the target, you sin, all right? So this is a, I think it's a beautiful and providential meaning in the English language. It really does, I think, hit the mark. Because what is the goal? The goal is communion. When you sin, you fall out of communion, right? So that is the goal. That's the uh, that's the transgression. Think about that. And hopefully tonight, after you get done with this talk, you'll get out of any legalistic, moralistic paradigm that you're in. I want you to get out of that. And it's all about communion with the person of Christ. It's all about communion of persons and being in the same place being in communion that's what salvation is and that's what sin and iniquity brings us and it disrupts this communion takes us out of this communion so returning to that which is what the church is all about restoring man to god and making him like unto god because when you're in communion with god when you know him love him and commune with him those divine characteristics are communicated in the incarnation, what do we have? In, in, in Christ, the Theanthropos, we have the Adam, we have a man and God united. That same unity is communicated to all those who die and rise and are, are chrismated and communing with God, that he, he lives in us and we in him, and all of that, which is clearly spelled out in the Gospel of John when he's talking about the communion and how we must eat the body and drink the blood. Everything is there. And of course, in St. John's epistles and gospels, it's all very clear that this is salvation. Salvation is to be in communion. I don't know how in the world, I know, I mean, it's very strange, but I guess we can, historically, we can figure it out, but it's very tragic that 
that we have a dissolution of this very basic understanding of salvation in the West, where we end up with a very legalistic and moralistic understanding of things. And so it's about, it's a tragedy, but it's not surprising that Anselm and company and scholastics and all the rest end up with a very dry scholastic and legalistic understanding of sin and forgiveness and communion. Now, I'm sure that somebody could say, well, actually, if you read this text or that text, you're going to see a very patristic understanding. I understand that it was mixed for a long time, but the reality is that it was introduced and it was accepted as something that's consistent with the gospel. No, it's not. And here in this psalm, I think we should see at the end of the night that how important it is to understand that it's a person that you've fallen away from, and it's a person you have to return to. And it's a communion with that person, and a likeness is which is the ultimate end of this communion, to be like him according to everything by grace, to become a God by grace, in other words, by his gift and, and, and communion in him. Against thee only have I sinned and done this evil before thee. So this is interesting. I, I'm sure that many of us have thought, well, that's kind of curious. Didn't I sin against, didn't, didn't David sin or don't I sin against my neighbor? Don't I sin against uh, the, uh, uh, the, the various people that I actually committed? The, I mean, he committed adultery. He essentially sent somebody off to their death and, and, and was hoping they would die. Uh, a murder. Uh, what about them? Aren't they victims of the sin? Well, of course they are. Of course they are. This is not saying they're not. But what's really happening deep, deep uh, in this um, relationship is he's realizing that he's coming to himself. And he's realizing that first and foremost, for me to do this injustice and this iniquity, I turned away from God. And I'm now acknowledging that God saw everything. I'm coming to terms with what I have done. I'm coming back to him and I've been separated from him because it's in him that I'm in communion with my neighbor. This is one of the great tragedies of our days is that there's this idea very much under the weight of humanism that we can love our neighbor independently of loving God. What do you think humanism is all about? Love, 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 love. Yeah, okay. But during the COVID period, we had shut down the churches to love our neighbor. You know, this is delusional. You cannot love your neighbor if you do not love God. And if you don't obey his commandments and worship him and commune with him, you can't love your neighbor. That's it. It's not going to happen. It's going to be a... a, a a collection of, uh, you know, water and dirt, basically, which is going to crumble because it's human, only human. It has to be divine human. It has to be divine and human. It has to be stavruki. It has to be vertical and horizontal at the same time, always. So he says, St. Nathan, he says, that is, explaining this phrase, while he hid the sin from the eyes of everyone, they did not know he hid the sin. Nobody knew that he had intentionally sent off his husband to die. And only later, you know, he ostensibly married her only after he died, right? And so he was hiding, attempting to hide everything from man. But from God, he realized he cannot hide. And so he is coming to him and saying, I've sinned against thee. I've done this evil before thee. You have seen this evil and I'm coming to repent. He goes on, for behold, I was conceived in iniquity and in sin did my mother bear me. The first decision of God was for us not to come into being through marriage and corruption. Adam and Eve, of course, were created not through the uh, coming together of man and woman. Transgression of the order of God introduced this. In other words, he foresaw the fall. And he foresaw the, the, the departing from his grace and presence and communion, and the man would be left to his device. And so he foresaw the continuation. He, he cared for the continuation of the race of man. And he, allowed, he put in man and woman the ability for the seed to be planted and to be uh, multiplied. 
And therefore, all the descendants of Adam are conceived in iniquity and participate in the condemnation of the forefather. So this participation is not akin to a guilt. We're not, we're not guilty for his sin, but we end up in this condition, this fallen condition, we end up doing the same as Adam and as Eve. We follow in their footsteps. We're, we're sick with the same sickness uh, as, as Adam and Eve were sick. So this is what is meant here. And it's been, unfortunately, just, uh, the interpretation of that has been not uh has been distorted in the west and not totally patristically understood and so they give a kind of moralistic and legalistic way of understanding this and then they need for for instance the mother of god to be born without any to be born immediately without any possibility of sin this is the immaculate conception of the of the papal protestants that well if this is the case and this is the condition it's passed on Almost, you know, by sexual acts, uh, by generation duration, and therefore anybody born now is uh, guilty of the sin of Adam. Like we participate in the guilt, and we're as, as as if we're committing it from beginning of our existence. And this is the misinterpretation of the Apostle Paul. Anyway, then they have the idea where well, we have to we have to spare the Mother of God of even the possibility of sin. And so she doesn't have any participation in Adam and Eve and the rest of humanity, which makes her essentially not like the rest of us, which is a, a disaster in terms of our soteriology. It's a falling away from patristic soteriology. So they misunderstood, in part, this passage from the prophet David. In sins did my mother bear me means that Eve... Uh, I think the original is not in sins. I think that's a typo on my on my part. Um, in sin. My sin is ever before me against you. The only sin is before just and in and in sins actually it's correct. So it's a typo in the in the in sins that my mother bear me. The first decision of God was for us to not, uh, sorry, now we're down here, it means that Eve, in sins of my mother bear me, means that Eve, the mother of us all, first conceived sin being dominated by the pleasure, desire of pleasure. She's the first who looked on, listened to the serpent, looked on the fruit and desired it and fell into this slavery to the pleasure. So we too, falling into the condemnation of the foremother, also say that we are conceived in sin. He sparks, he, he speaks, it should be, of the events from the beginning, for he wants to show the greatness of the gift of God. These are just, by the way, these are just excerpts from a longer uh, commentary by St. Athanasius. Not much longer, a little bit longer, because I, I was able to do the entire word by word commentary by the way this is i have here the icon of saint athanasius just to, from the skeet of saint andrew on mount athos and uh god help us to never not speak anything that would be contrary to what saint athanasius intended we have now two translations we're working on greek modern greek and then english so Let's not get too bogged down in the whole question of ancestral sin and all the rest. This is probably a whole other talk. Uh, for behold, thou hast loved truth. The hidden and secret things of thy wisdom hast thou made manifest unto me. And here the meaning of this is thou, O Lord, who art the truth and loves the truth and wants to, us to live in the truth, will cleanse us entirely from the ancient sin and you will cleanse us with hyssop so well and we will become whiter than snow. With regard to the hyssop, he likens it to the energy or operation of the Holy Spirit, which is fervent and wipes away all of our impurity. It's very, very important uh, to consider here that the Lord who loves truth, who is truth, who reveals truth, this is the means by which people become 
sons of God again and are freed from slavery. It's only in and through the truth that we have purification, right? There are, unfortunately, the idea out there that somehow we can have moral, uh, we can reach a moral height, we can reach a, 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 a exalted morality without faith, without embracing and loving the truth. And we have this separation today of uh, and wanting to make Christianity and the church into a purely horizontal affair. What do I mean by horizontal affair? In other words, it's about improving the moral and the spiritual and maybe even the, the worldly, physical, economic plight uh, of man and making life on this earth better. And that the whole weight of the life in the church is to be a morally superior person, to increase our morality, uh, to do things that are according to the law, according to the uh, the good of the uh, of the of the many, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these things, when they're separated, and they're not, they're separated from the truth, and they're not an outgrowth of the love of truth. They're not in a relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. They ultimately are not salvific. Saint Ignatius Branshinov says very clearly that this kind of humanism does not save. If you love and forgive, but have no reference and no communion, and ultimately no uh, part, existential part of Christ, which means to be a part of the church, then what we're not we're talking about is not eternally significant. This is very hard for most of us to understand. We want everything that anyone does, we want it to be seen as if uh, contributing to salvation. But when we think like that, we think of salvation as something we earn, ultimately. We think of salvation as something we achieve. We think of salvation as something we do. We do many good things, we are saved. That is all in the realm of moralism, brothers and sisters. And it's a fall from the gospel of Jesus Christ. The order of things is essential. Of course, you're going to do good things. Of course, you're going to be moral. Of course, you're going to strive to be just. Of course. But as in what way? Not as an autonomous being, but as one in communion, as an expression and extension of the fruit of communion. As, as God in us, as not I, but Christ who lives in me, right? As one who's been purified and illumined by the presence of the Holy Spirit, then is not the works that we do, but the works that God does through us. Very different. One is salvific, saves a thousand around you. The other is me, my efforts, my work, my ideas, and you know my goodness, whatever, if we can even call it that, it's very, it's very different. So we have, we have to be very careful uh, that we approach things always in a purely orthodox soteriological perspective. All right, Anna, we'll see you in a little while. God bless you. The hidden things of thy wisdom indicates that God revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he, all that he imparted unto his wisdom. So again, this is, according to St. Athanasius, a indication that the wisdom that he has, the knowledge that he has of the truth is given by God himself, who reveals it in communion with, with, uh, with David. David is saying that all that I know and all that I see, it's your revelation that you make manifest unto me in the depths of my noose of my heart. And he goes on, that's what sprinkle me with hyssop and I should made clean. He is pointing to a mystery here. Now there's other things said, but I miss, I'm going right to what St. Anthony says here. I think it's in, in, more important, but there's more to be said here uh, on the basics of, of the text. But I, I think this interpretation is noteworthy. Just as Moses in Egypt ordered that the doorways be painted with the blood of sheep, by the way of hyssop, we were brought with much more valuable blood. All right, so he's saying, yeah, this is, this is recalling essentially that by sprinkling of blood, David, uh, Moses and the Lord saved the people from destruction. 
but really it's pointing to the blood of the lamb, the valuable, invaluable lamb, uh, lamb's blood. Through this is indicated the purification of all in the future through the blood of the true lamb of Christ. He des deeply desires that this, if possible, for only this blood is able to entirely purify and make one whiter than snow. So essentially, the, the Saint Athanasius is very bold in saying, even the prophet David, even then, was really foreshadowing and speaking to the Messiah that will that was to come, and he was saying that through the Messiah, this washing will ultimately be achieved. Thou shalt make me to hear joy and gladness. It's very interesting. If you think about it, he's coming here. He's got this weight of sin on him, and yet he's bold enough. And he has such a relationship with God that he's bold enough to say, even in the midst of this, thou shalt make me to hear joy and gladness. You will restore me. You will give me, again, the fruit of a communion with you, which is joy and gladness. So he says, please, he will take care of me for once to once again hear, hear, once again hear by the Holy Spirit, the joy and gladness which will be brought in the end times. It's interesting that St. Athanasius is pointing already to the new covenant. He's constantly bringing it back. He's saying David is really talking about that great joy and gladness that will come with the resurrection. Listen to what he says. By this he means nothing else but the knowledge which is connected with the resurrection, which was taught by the words, the bones that be humbled, they shall rejoice. So he goes, that's, that's the continuation of the phrase. So how... Well, what will happen? In what way will we hear joy and gladness? The bones that be humbled, they shall rejoice. And he's saying this is pointing to the resurrection. Our soul be restored, which had previously been exhausted on the uh, on account of sin. And so the resurrection will be not only a spirit, uh, physical, but a spiritual resurrection first and foremost. The resurrection of the soul, which had been exhausted on account of sin. Turn thy face away from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Once again, he returns to confession. He's going back again and again to confession of sins, acknowledgement of sins, self-knowledge. We, we started out by talking about how he came to himself. That self-knowledge is absolutely essential. When you begin to have self-knowledge, then you can begin to have great hope that you will know God as well. Let me repeat that. Self-knowledge leads to God knowledge. Aftonosia leads to theognosia. Theos, theos, God knowledge. And they're inseparable and the one has to lead to the other. So here we see that connection, that self-knowledge, show me my sins, blot out my iniquities, turn away that, that face from my sins. I understand that I have sinned, I have iniquities, but don't uh, count them lo any longer. Don't consider them any longer. Turn away from them and blot them out. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. He says, renew in me, renew my soul, which has grown old and been made fragile through sin, and renew a right spirit within me. That is, make it stable, as if to guard, as if he said, guard your noose so that it is no longer able to, to fall easily into sin. This is a literal translation of the Greek. Guard your noose on the spirit of man, which communes with God, not the rational intellect, but the noose, the, the let's say, spiritual intellect, if you like. There's a lot of different ways we can talk about it, but the spirit of man, so that it no longer able is able to fall easily into sin. So renew a right spirit, a straight, strong spirit. Later on, he'll call it... Uh, a governing spirit, right spirit, governing spirit. And this brings a spiritual stability. People come back again and again for confession. They say, Father, I did the same sins again and again. Well, we have to say here that if we're going back again and again, then there's something wrong with the communion. There's something wrong with the communication. We're falling out of communion, essentially. If you're in communion, you have a governing spirit, you have a straight spirit, you're stable in that relationship, you will not fall. 
into those habitual sins, those old sins, the same old, same old, right? Judgmentalness, jealousy, or even worse. So we have to admit that every time we fall into those, what's the common denominator? We fell out of communion, even for seconds or for minutes. We, In other words, we turned away. We were not praying. We were not mindful. We were not in the presence of God. It's impossible for somebody to be truly in the presence of God, to be in communion with God, to be praying to God, and at the same time, is truly doing this, not just saying the words, but actually in communion, at the same time, to fall into the sins, to fall away from God. Those two things are opposite. They're not possible. So we have to admit that we are responsible for every fall into sin. We turn away. We neglect so great a salvation and so great and wonderful a communion. Our mind is not watchful. Our heart is not prayerful. And that's why we fall into sin. But now we're praying, God, renew a right spirit, a strong spirit, a stable spirit within me that I not fall back into sin. Create in me a clean heart. Renew that old soul that's been corrupted, that's been become impure. And recreate, renew again within me, O oh God, that right and clean heart. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So you see right there, he's recognizing the very likely possibility that one can fall away from the Holy Spirit and his presence. And he's begging him not to fall away from the presence, not to have the Spirit be taken from him because of his his inconstancy. His, con, his inconstancy. Is that the right? And he says, St. Athanasius says, once again, make it possible for the prophetic Spirit to return to him should abandon him on account of sin. Interesting, he says prophetic spirit, right? We often think of prophets as a very small group of people, very limited. Once upon a time in the church, there were prophets. It's not true. Prophet is anyone who speaks, lives and speaks in the truth to his generation. Now, of course, there are certain, there are prophets and then there are prophets, right? It's like there are priests and then there are general priesthood. Just like there are saints, and then St. Paul refers to the whole Church of Corinth as the saints. Well, there are prophets, very well known in church history in the Old Testament. And then there is the prophetic spirit that dwells in all those who speak and live the truth, right? I think there's both and, right? It's both and. Mary says to us, helping us, I'm assuming, to understand the Jews were told to dip a hyssop branch into the blood of a lamb and strike the doorpost and top off their doors to let the avenging angel know that their home and property were not to be destroyed. Yes, a hyssop branch was soaked in vinegar and offered to Jesus Christ after he said, I thirst. That's correct. So, yeah, people think maybe hyssop is some kind of uh, liquid. huh? Is that what people think? Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So you figure that out. That's good. Okay. So we're, we're, we're now we're going on to this. We just finished here. We're going to 15. <clears throat> Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. People ask, how do I know if I'm saved or I'm being saved? Orthodox sometimes say that. Uh, somebody said, how do I know if I'm repenting? And the answer is going to be the fruit. The Lord says, you know the truth by the fruit. And one of the fruits of being saved, like we say as Orthodox, we're saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved, right? It's a continual process. On the one hand, we're objectively saved. All of humanity has been saved from the eternal death because there will be a resurrection. And the soul and the body of every one of us will be reunited. In that sense, we're saved. And saved is from the Greek word nasothi, sotiria, and that means wholeness, right? It means wholeness. The term is used all the time in Greek, and it doesn't always mean the wholeness that we're talking about here in salvation. It could be many things. I was saved by from death by, you know, I was saved from... Excuse me, 
uh, financial destruction, or whatever. So salvation here, what's the, one of the fruits of salvation? It's to be in the joy of the Lord. What's the one of the fruits of repentance? It's that if we're on the path of repentance and we're repenting, we're returning. And what does that mean? That we're going again and again back to the church. We're going again and we're, we're struggling to be faithful. We're struggling to pray. We're struggling to repent. We're struggling to go to confession. That whole process of go, struggling is itself the path of salvation. So it's itself already a kind of holiness that can be attained if you are faithfully Day in and day out, through thick and thin, faithful, trusting God, not turning away, not falling in despair, right? So the joy, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. If you're on the path of salvation, you're going to have joy. You're not going to be miserable. You're not going to complain all day. You're not going to moan and groan and whine. These are not signs of one on the path of salvation. Sure, there's going to be leapy uh, sorrow, but there's going to be hara, joy. We have the term during Lent, harmo leapy. What is that? The, this mixture of both. We live both in a mysterious way. We're both joyful and sorrowful. That's why in Greek it's harmo leapy. In English it's the joy, joyful sorrow. It's this mystery of at the same time we we live the joy of salvation at the same time we're mourning over the sins that we committed we're seeing ourselves and our sins and we're sober we're seeing the world and its state under the devil all of that brings us pain of heart it brings us sorrow which is a godly sorrow though it's not a sorrow into condemnation and judgment because we end up su committing suicide or we are hopeless and we're it's a it's a sorrow that is blessed it's a sorrow that is loving is a sorrow that is co-suffering right and in mixed in mixed in all that is the joy at the same time in the in in spite of all this fallen world this valley of tears that we live in we see and we live the presence of christ he is our joy right so he's crying out restoring me the joy of thy salvation and this is, he says, not referring just to himself, like he's special and he's saved, but all of the joy of all of humanity at seeing what? The presence of the Lord in the world, his incarnation, his crucifixion, his resurrection. It's referring to the whole entire human race. It refers to the presence, should be presence, typo, of the Lord According to the word of Simeon, my eyes have seen thy salvation. He is our salvation. His presence is our joy. His, he is uh, our reward, and we are his reward, says in the book of Revelation. One and the same. The, the faithful, uh, it's great in English. In Greek, it makes even better. Christos, ine i amivi tupistu. It rhymes. Uh, Christ is the reward of, this, of the faithful, and the faithful are the reward of Christ. Like, what is Christ's reward for all that he does? That he saves us. That he achieves a victory over our enemy. That he gives us his life. We are his joy, and he is our joy. It goes... It's... it's uh indivisible really ultimately right the spirit which he calls above right he calls here governing like governing spirit establish me now in greek governing spirit is what we talked about earlier pnevmati igemoniko and so this is when the noose of man right the spiritual spirit of man, the spiritual intellect, if you like. There's different words you can try to describe this mystery. It's when it's guided by the spirit. The spirit itself establishes man in himself, right? Abba, Father, crying out to God, the Apostle Paul talks about. It's the spirit himself who establishes us. It's his presence which makes us stable. It's his presence which guides us in all truth and gives us discernment of the spirits. Thy governing spirit establish me. It's the only way one is established. 
is that his spirit dwells in us. The fruit of that, the proof of that is in the virtues. It's in the discernment that comes to man. It's in the peace that comes, which passes all understanding. That's the proof that you have been established by the governing spirit, right? These phrases are extremely important in the in the 50th Psalm. And when I pray, when I pray the prayer, the 50th Psalm, I'll just tell you to share, if, 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 you know, take it or leave it. But where my mind is almost always focused, or it changes, but it's predominantly I am looking at these phrases. Uh, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation with thy governing spirit established. Those three lines are the core of the restoration of man and the fruit of communion, fruit of repentance, rather, in communion. Right? And then again at the bottom, which we'll talk about separately. Sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a heart that is broken and humble, O oh God, that will not despise. That's the other, you know, they're all they're all extremely instructive, but there are f lines which jump off the page. And we can kind of stop and meditate, as it were, and reflect on these because they're extremely powerful. And this is one of them. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation and with thy governing spirit establish me. Who doesn't want the joy of salvation and the stability of and the governing of the Spirit of God Himself. What else do you want? Right? I shall teach transgressions thy ways, he goes on, and the ungodly should be back unto thee. By the way, the numbers here on the left are not corresponding to the verses. So we're not at 16 right now. Uh, we are at 13, just so you know. The numbers here are just my numbers for the points I'm making. I shall teach transgressors thy ways, and the ungodly shall turn back unto thee. If you free me from sin, St. Athanasius says, and once again grant me thy spirit, most certainly I will teach transgressors to return to thy way. I think it's not at all ever a accident. There's no accidents in Scripture. I want you to know that the fact that he's talking about the ways, odos, odos in Greek, uh, in particular, let me just read the entire phrase in Greek for those Greek speakers. Didaxo onomos das odus su, kia sevis epise epistrepsusi. So I'm going to teach the iniquitous ones, the lawless ones, your ways, your way of being, right? So that's the Lord himself. Why? Because we know. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Right? So the way of Christ, I will teach Christians thy ways, essentially is I will teach the lawless to come under the lawgiver. I'll teach the iniquitous ones the new way of life who is Christ. Right? Christ himself. He is the way. And Another way, another way we talk about this aspect of our life in Christ, we could we could say is very close to this, is the ethos, is the way of life. So here we're talking about the way or the ethos of uh, one who lives according to God and in God. And the natural fruit of all this is that people will return to God around you, just like St. Saint, Saint Seraphim of Seraph said, the thousand around you will be saved. Here it is, right, in 50th Psalm. They shall turn back unto thee, because now I am restored, I have a governing spirit, I have the joy of salvation, and I, I am t telling people, I'm teaching and showing them thy ways. Deliver me from the goodness of God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue shall rejoice in thy righteousness. So again, he implores the Lord to deliver him comes back again and again to the need for, I mean, he's expressing his deep repentance, right? So coming back again and again to the sins that he committed and they're ever before him and they're humbling him and they're teaching him. And so this is uh, referring to that sin of murder. And he's asking God to release him from the impurity 
which he suffered on account of the murder of this innocent man. Now it says at this section, we're at uh, section 16, page 81, for anybody who might have this, excuse me, this volume. I'm going to, on the fly here, I'm going to translate some things that I didn't get to translate before. And besides this, going back to the murder of Uriah, he says, Exematon, the Exematon, the blood guiltiness, Risime Exematon, deliver me from the blood, basically, that was shed, right? Being guilty of that blood. He means here not just the blood. There's two different ways we can look at it, not just the blood of Uriah, but actually in a wider sense, this is interpreted, there's many layers to Scripture. The blood of the sacrifices. Uh, and it says in the song, Oti ithel sestesi and edekanan, for if thou had desired sacrifice i had given it right so it's, it's talked about in this psalm and all the psalms the sacrifice this blood uh of animals that sacrificed he's saying deliver me from this as well and he's also saying my tongue shall rejoice in thy righteousness uh For the, I will not, I will rejoice in thy righteousness, he says, because I will not remain silent when I receive forgiveness, when I return to communion. And that's what that means, forgiveness. I will not remain silent of the great gift of communion that you've given me. But I will praise continually, and I will narrate and tell of all your benefactor. Be, uh, what's the word? Uh, all of your uh, beneficence, or all of you, all of the good things that you've done for me. For you have you have uh, resigned from the sacrifices of the law, for they were not able to impart remission of sins, and for this. You are given a sacrifice which you preferred. You didn't prefer the sacrifice of bloody animals, but the what sacrifice? The sacrifice that comes with repentance and a broken and contrite heart. That is the sacrifice that God now wishes. So you can see here that he's applying it to the universal salvation. He's saying, yeah, it's okay. It's, it's certainly on one level having to do with Uriah, but it's actually having to do with the whole change now from the old law to the new, from the salvation in Christ, the bloodless sacrifice of Christ. This now is uh, what I, he's begging to be re relieved of this old law sacrifice, which did not bring about the remission of sins, but in rather deliver me from blood, that blood, you know, and my tongue is so rejoice in that right. In other words, if you restore me and you forgive me, then I will, Rejoice in thy righteousness. That is what uh, is implied here. Now, strangely, and it's I have no idea why, except that maybe the manuscript has been corrupted. These last, these three verses, 15, 16, and 17, are not covered in the commentary of St. Athanasius. So I'm just going to say a few words on these, and you can take it or leave it, because this is just Father Peter. I didn't get to look uh, at, extensively at St. Athan at St. At Blessed Augustine on these particular passages. Uh, I have ex excerpts from his commentary, but not the entire commentary. Uh, but we'll revisit this. I think it's worth revisiting. It's very important, these three phrases. So he goes on. Of course, you know it. O Lord, thou shalt my lips from mouth to declare thy praise. For if thousands are sacrificed, I had given it. The whole burnt offerings, thou shalt not be pleased. So here again, he comes back and he says, the whole burnt offerings are over. They're done. Even, even the prophets pointing out that they will no longer be the sacrifice that God desires. Rather, a sacrifice unto God is a broken spirit of heart that is broken and humbled. God will not 
despise. Why is it that there will be no despising of a broken and contrite heart, a humbled uh, heart? Precisely because that broken and contrite heart, that pain of heart, that love, that humility, that repentance restores that person to communion with God. And therefore, what's to despise? He will see us as his own. He will see us as an extension of his self because we he will dwell in us and we in him. You see how it's not a legalistic, moralistic thing at all. It's about communion. communion. Everything can be explained by outside or inside of communion. And that's how it is with the canons of the church. That's how it is with the biologies of the church. It's all right there in the, in the canons and the boundaries of the church. It's all about communion or not communion. That's why it's not about the particular heresy somebody teaches. And the idea that, oh, well, they teach a really severe heresy. They're further away. The minute you fall out of communion, the minute you walk away from the Eucharist, the mysteries, the faith, you are in the same lot as all the rest who've walked away from communion in the mysteries and in the faith, confessing the faith. You might have a different path back. It might be easier if you only have one error as opposed to 10, of course. That has to do with the degree of obstacles that your pride and arrogance and, and, and worldliness have erected. It doesn't have anything to do with the status that you now hold, which is outside of communion. This cannot be overstressed in the day of ecumenism. I want you to go back and listen to this on the recorder five times you will be protected against the lies of the ecumenists and the delusions of those who are under the weight of scholastic theology who want to make the problem the various heretical theologies per se and only those. Oh, well, we've found out this is what happens. What, what's wrong with that? Oh, we understood now the filioque wasn't a problem. Filioque was not an obstacle. Okay, we're ready for communion. Really? Besides the fact that filioque is a problem, let's just examine that idea. There's no need to return. There's no need to be initiated. There's no need to be, re to, to be reinstated, to go through the initiation process, to be baptized, chrismated, commune. We can just say it, the problem was one of the dhyanya. The problem was one of how we think about God. Really? Is that how we're established in Christ, that we think about him right? The fact that you and I think right about him, is that all we need to be in communion with God? Of course not. We have to actually be in communion. It's a existential, hypoxiaki, we say in, English, in Greek, right? It's, existential. It's, it's like real. Like we were eyewitnesses, the Lord says. I touched his hand. I touched the side, right? That's That existential real thing is not just for the 12 apostles or the 70. It's for every single initiated, baptized, chrismated, communing Orthodox Christian. It's the scandal of the Eucharist, the scandal of the particular. You must be in communion with me, he says. You have to eat my body, drink my blood. Those who have departed for whatever reason from the communion, certainly there might be different ways of, re of reconciliation in the sense that somebody who's been baptized is not going to be rebaptized in the church, in the church. But they're still outside the communion. They still have to be. They're 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 in the same lot as far as their as far as communion goes, which is salvation. Uh, this this cannot be overstated, right? So that's why God does not despise, because they're the broken heart, the sacrifice of a broken heart. It tears down the walls. You don't have to become a theologian to tear down the wall. You don't have to understand the filioque way to tear down the wall. What do you need to do? A broken spirit, a heart that is broken and humbled. That opens the doors. And then, of course, you have to be united. But God will not despise that. He will bless it. He will welcome you, right? He will do his good pleasure. He will do his good pleasure. So probably you probably have covered the hyssop. 
<laughs> you guys have done like a study on the hyssop tonight. It's all right. It's good. We can probably move on from the hyssop. All right. Just looking at your comments because I can't look at them. Continue. I wonder, has... Uh, all right. Very good. Do good, O Lord, and thank a pleasure in the Sion. St. Athanasius says, with, under no, with no qualms, he says, Sion is the church. Sion is the church. Somebody going to say, well, that's and I, and I, uh, uh, I can't even say the word now. So I'm tired. Anachronistic. I'm not saying it right. This is the idea that we reinterpret things in previous times based on contemporary understandings. And so therefore we distort what the, the, uh, the, the prophet meant. You see that the St. Athanasius didn't have any qualms. He didn't have any problems saying straight out, this is the church. Well, contemporary academics will say, it's not the church. He didn't mean the church. What's he talking about? He didn't even know about the church. Well, yes and no. You think, Mr. Academic Theologian, you think that that which they lived, if you hear kids running around screaming, that's my kids in the background. I got two little ones that they're, this is the time of day that they're free to roam. They finished their studies, they finished this, and now they're running around the house. So you'll have to uh, bear with me or enjoy the, the little voices. Um, so the little Mr. Academic Theologian, I want to tell you something. You think that the experience of the prophets is essentially different than the experience of the apostles? You think that the 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 the, the, uh, the Lord of Glory who was appearing and speaking and communicating with all the prophets is some other Lord that was not incarnate? When they say Sion, they mean, of course, the people of God in the Old Testament. But that is the church. The church meaning, essentially, all those who are gathered together in communion with God. So the prophet would have no problem saying with St. Athanasius, Sion means the church. It's not a problem. The Holy Spirit that enabled one is enabling and inspiring the other. For he, when it was the Father's good pleasure to recapitulate all things, things should be things by his Son, then he gave to his church the good news. This is the St. Athanasius saying that this is the church. Do good, O Lord, and good pleasure unto the church, unto the gathering of all the believers in me, under all those who have communion with me. Do good, O Lord. What's the fruit of this broken heart? It's good pleasure of God unto his people. You see how his repentance is not some individualistic thing. It's connected to the whole of the people of God. As the king, certainly that is understandable, but it's true for every one of us. All of us are kings and prophets, are we not? Kings, prophets, and priests, every Orthodox Christian. You are a prophet. In God, you are a king in God, you are a priest in God, all of us. So all of us and everything we do affects and implies the body. We're not, you can't, if you talk about my body and then you talk about my leg, are you talking about another body? You talk about my finger, you talk about my eyes. Is there some, are you talking about another person? You are the leg, I am the foot, you know, the other person's the hand. All of us are the body. You can't. Tear it apart and say, well, no, 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 I'm talking about Father Peter here, not the body. I'm talking about Jim, not the body, right? No, no, no. It's all the body. We're all together in this. Just like when he talks about Zion, it's the church. When he talks about his repentance, it's the repentance ultimately. It, it impacts and it's part of the repentance of the whole people of God. And so that's why this is not just about one person's repentance. And it says, let the walls of Jerusalem be builded. I love this phrase. And I have my own little interpretation. I'll just share it with you. But I think it works. I think it's it's perfectly uh, in harmony with what I understand the saints saying. St. Athanasius says, the walls of Jerusalem are the holy celebrants. Irgus, 
Irogos is the priest who celebrates the divine liturgy, right? He's Irogos, which stand guard around his church. Very interesting, right? So the walls of Jerusalem are not physical walls. They were, they are, they're both ends, both ends, right? They were the walls of Jerusalem. But he doesn't mean like build them up, like, like they, that's going to make any difference. No, he's obviously metaphorically and maybe literally, but also metaphorically. Spiritually, the walls are the celebrants of the divine liturgy who stand guard around his church. And I would say that when we say that the walls of Jerusalem be builded, it's the building up of the church. And how do we build up the church? By each one of us becoming like Christ, acquiring the virtues. And that's how Jerusalem, the church, is built up. Each one of us becomes like Christ's saints throughout all the virtues, right? So that's another way to take it or leave it. Then shalt thou be pleased with a sacrifice of righteousness and uh, sacrifice of righteousness. The, then sacrifices will be offered, not blood sacrifices, but of righteousness and praise. So again, clearly pointing to the end of the sacrifices. Those are not the end. Like the poor, poor, poor Jewish people, the people who call themselves Jews today, because it, it's a huge chasm between the contemporary Jewish people and the people who lived at the time of our Lord, who became his disciples, unfortunately. We have a massive chasm between the experience of the one and the other. They turned away from the incarnate Logos who spoke to them in the Old Testament. Uh, but there will be some that will come back, according to the Apostle Paul. In any case, that will end. Even the prophet is saying, you're not pleased with that, but you're pleased with a sacrifice of righteousness and praise. Righteousness and praise is living according to the commandments. It's being in communion, that's what it means to be righteous, to share in his righteousness. With oblation and hopered offerings, these likewise refer to righteousness and the bloodless sacrifice. Right? Thou shalt, then thou shalt be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness and oblation. Then shall they offer bullocks one another. Again, St. Athanasius doubles down, triples down, and he says, of righteousness, sacrifices, offerings, burnt offerings, bullocks are all in this context of sacrifices of righteousness. He doesn't really mean, because when will he be pleased? When we do his will, when, when, the, when the, the walls are built up, the virtues are acquired, when the church, the good pleasure is visited upon a broken and contrite, here, contrite heart. Throughout this whole psalm, he's saying that's what's important, not the burnt offerings. So he's not going to come back at the end and say, Oh, yeah, and by the way, burnt offerings are really important. He's going to say, then shall they be pleased with these things. Only when these things are done do these other things that are types are going to make any sense and have any meaning. In fact, only because of them they have meaning. And through them they have meaning. Acquisition of righteousness. Then these things have some meaning. They have, they're, they're fulfilled, right? They're fulfilled. Uh, and with that is the end of our look, our brief look at Psalm 50 which I admit is uh, needs to be revisited because we do need to hear from um, we do need to hear from other saints and elder Athanasius. So we'll visit we we'll revisit this in the future. Uh, hopefully this has been helpful. I see three questions right now waiting for me. Not a lot of questions. We don't have a big crowd tonight because it's Wednesday, but that's okay. People will come back and watch this in due time. I see here uh, some kind of questions going on, but I'm just going to go right to the questions. If somebody wants to ask a question, like I think Nikolica, uh, you have a question. Should I? Why don't we start with that? Because I see it right here in front of me. What if, what if they, uh, I think, is there a previous sentence here that I'm missing? What if they are under uh, a penance, is that the right word? And not able to receive, for whatever reason, loss of child or loss of, or even something else. Not able, not able to receive communion, a soldier from war. Uh, 
I'm not sure the question. I lost the the uh, context for the question. Do you want to ask it in the in the box? Why don't you ask in the box? Because I'm not I'm not following the question here in the uh, comments. All right, question number one uh, is from Alexandra. Dear Father, bless my priest wants to get together with us to ask us a bunch of questions about our involvement in online orthodoxy. Hmm. Is there is that something besides orthodoxy? I didn't know that. Is that like is that like anti-orthodoxy or unorthodoxy or non-orthodoxy? What does it mean? On, I mean, are we not orthodox because we're online right now? Does that do we cease to be orthodox when we go online? I'm not really sure what that means. That would be my first question. Father, what do you mean by online orthodoxy? Or is that code word for orthodox ethos? Because are you are you you're pretty involved in other stuff, but are you super involved in like a whole nother platform that he's maybe referring to? Or do you think that it's just this? Um, you say, I'm nervous about doing this. Should we just pray and go and be willing to try to answer the questions? We do love our priests, but I'm not sure the motive for this. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm kind of wondering what's going on. I don't know what to say. I think you should go. It's your priest. You should go. But I would ask questions. Uh, when somebody doesn't have a good disposition, ask a lot of questions. Just listen. Uh, ask, you know, for maybe time to think about it, pray about it, talk to other people about it. I don't think that doesn't sound like there's going to be any kind of like action taken or something. It's just going to be a discussion, right? I don't know what else to say. I would go listen, ask questions. All right. Question number. I did answer that. Let me get rid of that. Elena. And how do you stay in communion all the time in today's world? How do you stay in communion all the time in today's world? Very interesting question. So as you would in any other world, you have to shut out more and more today the distractions. And you have to be close to a church or a monastery that's going to have divine services. That's very important. And you're going to avail yourself to those divine services as much as possible. But on a daily basis, throughout the day, the cornerstone in your personal struggle, your personal walk, is going to be the Jesus prayer. Elena, have you bought any books on the Jesus prayer? Do you, have you read The Way of a Pilgrim? Have you read St. Ignatius Brian, branching off on the Jesus prayer? Have you read Elder Ephraim on the Jesus prayer? Have you... Uh, you know, have you done any serious reflection and have you talked to your spiritual father and have you gone to monasteries to talk about how you can practice the Jesus prayer? Now, somebody might say, Father, Father, I've heard this from different people. It's amazing to me. Father, what are you talking about? You can't tell people to do that. I actually had somebody tell me, who was it? Oh, I forget. I get too many people and I forget who tells me these things. But there was somebody who came to their, there was a priest who came to the people and said, do not practice the Jesus prayer. Do not, under any circumstance, practice Jesus' prayer. I was just blown away. I was like, whoa, what is that? Where did you get this? Okay, I can understand somebody saying, do not practice the Jesus prayer, um, you know, without any, uh, you, you know, go deep into its practices, do the breathing, uh, do thousands of, I can, that's understandable, right? Everything has to, done, has to be done in the right way. But not to do it at all. Like, don't even touch it. Why? Right? Why? What? What? What is they thinking? Uh, I tell people who are just starting out, and it might go on for a year, two, three. It might go on for a long time. I don't know. It depends on each person. I say, look, start with with either one of the two. Like, this is the minimum. Minimum, right? It's the bottom. You can't get any less, really less than that, but start incorporate in your prayer rule in the morning either one prayer rope of a hundred to Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a hundred times, and then a small 33, because it's a one to three ratio all the time, three to one, rather. 33, these little prayer ropes here, 
right? 33 times to the mother of God, most holy Theotoko Sabas. All right, just put that in your prayer rule every morning. Everybody can do that. You don't need a spiritual father for that. You don't need a prayer guide. That's just a basic, simple prayer. There's no threat of delusion if you do that. Just, just, just like any other prayer rule, morning prayers, supplication service, it's not an issue, right? Or if you have time, you have you can, you want, you can go 300, three times the 100 prayer rope to Christ and 100 times to the mother of God. You might say, well, that's a lot, Father. It's actually not that bad. It's actually, it's not that much. Now, I don't want to tell you, should I tell you how many people, I mean, how many do on Manathos? It's like 10 times that, you know, like most monks. So it's not that, it's not that much actually. And you can probably finish it in about 30 minutes. But whatever, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter the number. It matters how you do it, not how many. That comes with time. The real important thing is how you pray. So, how do you stay in communion with God? You you are in the you are in constant presence of God through prayer, and that prayer usually ninety five percent of the time today, we mean the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Most holy Theotokos, save us. And then all, all the rest, right? All the rest is going to be filling your life with that which is of God and getting rid of those distractions, getting rid of all the garbage, getting rid of the vanity, cutting off the things that are just of this world and do not help you and do not guide you, simplifying your life, living more in your house and before the prayer corner with things that are edifying, reading the books, all of it, all of it together. Creating a little home church, a little monastery inside your house, right, where there's peace and quiet, all that is going to help you to be constantly in communion with God, continuous communion with God. You need a spiritual father, though, if you want to go deeper in the prayer. All right, Mary has a question. I'm starting to answer right now. Father Peter, in the Orthodox Church, is there no differentiation in sin as in the church, uh, the papal Protestant slash Catholic Church, mortal versus venial? Okay, so let me answer that first, then I'll go to the second part. Mary, there is not the strict academic scholastic uh, classification uh, exactly the same, but there is a differentiation in terms of the weightiness uh, and the impact, but not a legalistic approach to it. So, you know, the one means, you know, X, the other means Y, right? It depends on, on different circumstances for those sins. So there's going to be always left up to the discretion of the spiritual father. Uh, so just to, for people who don't know, mortal sins, thanasima in Greek, which means death, you know, sins that bring about spiritual death, basically, versus venial, which I guess venial, I don't know what the Greek would be for venial. We don't really use that term even in English all that often anymore. Um, but it would be it would be ptesmata, probably in Greek. And that's like you know, not not weighty sins, but sins that are every day. Like uh, I fell and I got angry at my wife, you know, or something. Um now, that's a serious sin on one level, but it's something that happens in the midst of the struggle. And we fall, we get up, we fall, get up, okay? We're not going to be cut off from Holy Communion because we raised our voice. I mean, that's, I don't think most spiritual fathers are going to cut you off from Holy Communion. But if you committed a mortal sin, which would be on the level of what David did, right? You're talking about the prophet David did. You're talking about murder. You're talking about fornication. You're talking about adultery. You're talking about, you know, thievery, things like that are clearly you know not only on the noetic plane not only just morally you know re rejected as base but it's really almost like satanic or blasphemous right and it's uh it's very grave right so those sins absolutely need confession you need to go to confession for that. You need to repent immediately and you need to go to confession. And then there needs to be a therapeutic treatment of those sins. And usually most of the canons of the church are going to point to a abstention from Holy Communion for an extended time. And people might say, well, how is that going to heal somebody if you're not communing? 
because communion is not just in the Eucharist and confess and remission of sins is not just in confession. All of the mysteries are doing the same work. And so if you're in the church, repenting in the church, praying in the church, receiving through confession, the remission of sins, all this, you're in the church still. You're not rejected. You're still, you're part of the, is part, part of this whole ther- hospital of the soul and the therapy of the soul. So for there are times when it's not only a good idea or not a bad thing, but actually necessary spiritually for you to be, not be communing. And the Apostle Paul is very clear that there are those who commune under condemnation. So there's a possibility to go to communion when you should not, and you should not be going to communion, right? And do that under condemnation. It doesn't mean you're lost. It doesn't mean the grace of God is not visiting you. There are people, even today, who have been, you know, a year or two or three, they've been kept from Holy Communion for serious sins or multiple sins, and... Um, they made spiritual progress. Of course they're going to make spiritual progress because God seeing the broken heart is going to visit them and give them peace and give them courage. And eventually they're going to arrive once again at communion in the mysteries. Uh, They're going to have warfare. They're going to have difficulties. But those who have struggled through that and been patient and, and waited out the canon of, of repentance, the therapy, uh, they have had spiritual profit. Some greater, some less, but they've had spiritual profit. Okay, uh, you also ask about the EOB New Testament. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the Apple App Store has the EOB available for download for free. Oh, thank you very much, Mary. So that's an, good. I'll be getting that because I've, I've been wanting to look at that. So EOB, Eastern Orthodox Bible, I'm assuming that's what that means. I think it's, is it from New Rome Press or is that something separate? I always get confused. Is free at the Apple Store. All right, folks, everybody get that message. Next question, starting with from Tamara. Dear Father, bless, since it was mentioned how God did not first intend marriage, I will ask about this question. My biological father is not a believer. He and my mother go to a Unitarian Universalist, sadly, very, very liberal. He asked me, how did the children of Adam and Eve have children? What is it? I don't know what that means. Well, just like any other, but I mean, they're, they were, at that point they were procreating like every other human being because of incest. Is that what that means? There, there were no laws against incest at that point, obviously, because they had to have the continuation of the race. So I'm not sure you didn't specify, but I'm assuming that's what you're pointing to. Is that correct? You can let me know in the comments. That's my quick answer because I'm not really sure what you're asking happy to answer a more detailed question but that's the first response all right i don't see any more comments for a long time 11 minutes am i missing them or we have a problem with our communication here let me know if we got any issues, or hopefully you can let me know because I don't see anything, but there's no comments for like 10 minutes. So it's kind of strange. Hmm. Okay. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, and listening silent. Okay, good. Let's keep going. So last question that I can see is, yes, I try to say it throughout the day, but my job requires much concentration from Elena. Okay. Well, do it in the morning as a rule, Elena, the prayer. Do it in the morning as a rule. And 
begin to say it systematically when you can, and you'll see that it'll come to you more and more throughout the day, even when you're not sitting and intentionally trying to say it, right? Uh, the more we do it with concentration in the morning during the rule, the more we do it throughout the day when we can, the more it will start to creep in and it'll be in the, on our lips and in our heart. Uh, and when we, you know, don't, don't expect it. And then also when we can't systematically do it, it'll still be there. It'll be a presence there. I'm not sure how to explain it, but that's my experience. And there's no, you will have, if, if you invest the time, you will reap the benefits. God wants so much to be in communion with us. And he wants so much to be with us in uh, in our deepest reaches of our soul, uh, that if we just work with sincerity, it doesn't have to be huge numbers, but with sincerity and humility, then he will visit us and he will dwell with us. There are, there are many, many stories in the lives of the saints that would surprise us because we think always in terms of the most extreme examples, the stylites and the cave dwellers and the wonder workers, but there's tons and tons of others who were living the grace without the big name and the big numbers, right? All right, I don't see any more questions. I don't know if there's other issues with the psalm that you'd like to, to contemplate on. I see Despina says we're contemplating psalm. Yes, we are. Uh, I'm happy to go further into that, but I don't see any questions, not many questions on the psalm. Uh, let me, add, let's do a poll until I get some more questions. We'll do a poll and then we'll wrap it up. It's two hours right now. We don't have to go on for no reason. Uh, so let's do a poll here. Caesar's in the town, in the house. So there you go. There's no reason not to. And I guess my question is going to be, uh, have you memorized if you saw him? And then my next question is going to be, all right, so there's a new poll for you. Uh, do you use the Holy Transfiguration Psalter version. Of the 50th Psalm. All right. There's two, two uh, for you. Um, it is extremely important to memorize our prayers. Let me talk a little bit about prayer and Psalter a little bit <clears throat> in case people think that it's enough to just read out of the book. Yeah, we've got an improvement there, don't we, Alexandra? It's, it's, it's better off. Uh, so when you're a beginner, You've got the prayers of the fathers, the prayers of the prayer book, and you absolutely are going to want to use that as much as possible and become as familiar as possible. That's why it's important that the translation be really good and it be proper and it be high level quality because it's going to go in you. You're going to just you're eating this spiritual food, right? So you want it. You want to have that become a part of you. And one of the big reasons why we read the morning prayers and the evening prayers and the prayers of the saints is to learn how to pray and to assimilate their stance, their way, their ethos, right? So we learn all these prayers of the great saints, St. Basil, St. John, some other new saints, uh, new prayers, like there's a famous prayer by Elder uh, Sophroni of Essex that I have somewhere around here. I thought I had it right here, but anyway, it's a beautiful prayer. I've seen people, you know, using that. Whatever, it, it's very important. The Psalter, these these Psalms need to be need to be learned by heart. We need to memorize them. 
They need to become second nature. We can call on them at any time. Ideally, over time, you're going to want to be able to memorize your entire prayer rule, the morning prayer and the compline. You want to be able to know it by heart. And therefore, you, don't, you can be anywhere at any time and you can call on those prayers. And when you do that, when it becomes like second nature, then you're going to start to, it's going to be a different level uh, of, of intimacy. Uh, Tamara is coming back and just and asking a question, a follow-up question about her father's comment. That that's what I'm assuming, Tamara, is that he's just, he's assuming that the laws against incest incest were in effect. They obviously were not in effect. They were not given. They were not imparted to the people of God until much much later. So the Lord allowed this as long as it's not against His law and His will, then it's not a sin, right? And obviously it was necessary. Uh, Tamara for that to be the case because there were no other human beings to populate the earth. So the Lord allowed that. All right, so our polls are showing that 46% of you have memorized the 50th Psalm and 53% have not. And then about 58% of you use the Transfiguration Psalter and about 40% do not. Uh, how about the creed? Shall we ask uh, another psalm? Did we uh, another uh, poll? Uh, have you have you memorized the creed? And I wonder what version you're using because that's another big problem. Have you memorized? All right, another poll for you. Have you memorized the creed? Important. Um, Mary says that the EOB is only New Testament. Okay, that's good to know. All right, and then... Okay, so Despina has, has is sharing the link for that if you didn't see it. Okay. Let me see. My computer is frozen up here for a second. Hang on. Mary says, I've memorized the Apostles' Creed. Oh, that's interesting. We don't really use the Apostles' Creed in the Orthodox Church. It was mainly in the West in the early church, but it's not something used. Nicene Creed became the standard. Uh, it was an ecumenical council that adopted it, the Nicene Constantinople Creed. So the creed is actually two councils, right? The first ecumenical and the second ecumenical council. These two councils gave us the, the so-called Nicene Creed, but it's really the Nicene Constantinopolitan creed <laughs> and we don't call it the creed in the orthodox church we call it at least in greek the symbol of faith let's see it's it, it, it's it, it's the symbol of this pistios uh the creed is a just i mean it's fine the creed's fine but it's not not a term we use in the orthodoxy as much uh so in any case that that creed or symbol of faith is what was been universal uh, from the 5th century on and is actually said to be so by the ecumenical councils. Ecumenical council, the 3rd and the 4th especially, laid down this creed, the 1st and 2nd council creed, as the symbol of faith that must never be changed. And that's the one we should memorize. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, the one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Begotten of the Father before all ages, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made. Of one as the Father, by whom all things were made. For us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and of the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary became man, was crucified for us, and upon Pilate suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again. According to the scripture, sent to heaven, sits right hand of the Father. She come again with glory, the judge, with the living and dead, and his kingdom shall have no end of the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, proceeds from the Father, the Father and Son. Proceeds from the Father, not the Father and the Son, that's the Filioque. Proceeds from the Father. And with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, speak by the prophets and one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I 
confess one baptism for the mission. Some, some, some versions in English have I acknowledge, which is totally wrong. It's omologo in Greek, which is I confess one baptism. And that means not just the one time, but the one baptism of the one church, the Orthodox Church. I confess one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come. Amen. And remember, we believe and and it says, I believe in one God. I believe in the Father, the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the church. The church is not a human organism, but a divine human organ, organism. That's why we believe in it, right? Because it's God, it's Christ's body. That's why we believe in it. Uh, Mary, you can use the Apostles' Creed, but it's not the creed of the church. In other words, it's not that which has been embraced in ecumenical councils. So why would you use it? I mean, you need to start to use that which is prayed by the church in the divine liturgy, during Compline, uh, in the morning prayers. It's the Nicene Constantinople Creed. That's what's used. And little by little, you'll memorize it. You can, you, nobody, you, it's not, you don't, you don't have to stop saying the Apostles' Creed, but you can't say it instead of the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> St. Athanasius is said to have, uh, I think, compiled the Apostles' Creed. I think that's true. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any any other. If I don't see any other questions, we can wrap it up. But I'm happy to answer any, any more questions. Uh, I don't see any more in the question box. Let's see your polls. Most of you have have memorized the creed. That's a good thing. Now, now you need to memorize the fiftieth psalm. Right. Good. Do we have any other? Do we have any other? Um. Yes, very good, Mary. Uh, so do we have any more comments, questions before we, hang, we head out? Tomorrow night we're going to be back with you for our question and answer session, as usual, right here in these two places, Patreon and Orthodox Ethos. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. I'm going to play the chanting of the 50th Psalm as we go out. And... And then we might chant, play some other chanting as well. The Little Red Antiochian Prayer Book. That's fine, yeah. But I think I would recommend you learn one really well. Like you have that as your go-to prayer book. The Little Red one is fine, but it's not that extensive. It's not going to have all, everything you need. So my suggestion, Mary, is that you get the blue prayer book from Holy Church of Grish Monastery. It's the best English translation. It's Proper English. Let me see if I can get it right now, a link for you. Okay. I'm going to get that, and then we're going to sign out. All right, guys? And you can stick around to hear. Uh, you can stick around to hear the chanting. Let me just give you. A link to it. There it is. All right. So I'm going to give you this link. It's an Amazon link. And you can go from there. I think this is the best best version uh, personally. But, you know, it's, I'm not saying the world, but that's, a, that's the best version. Good night. God bless you all. Thank you very much for your prayers. Keep us in your prayers. A lot we could talk about, but we'll do it tomorrow night, all right? We'll see you tomorrow night. We've got a lot of contemporary events. Some of the uh, podcasts are coming out, some news about what we're doing. We've got more progress in our books, thank God. Uh, Jordanville Psalter is, is very close to the, uh, it's pretty close to the Transfiguration Psalter, but I do think the Transfiguration Psalter is superior in terms of its language, but that's just my subjective opinion. You don't have to listen to me. Uh, and if you're in, if you're in Rokor, then you should use whatever Rokor is using in the, in the, uh, divine services. Yes. We're going to go to that right now on a beautiful chanting of the 50th Psalm in Greek from Mount Athos. 
uh, from Philotheo Monastery. We'll play that. We'll play uh, the EXO, EXO uh, what do you call it, the exit uh, chanting. And we'll see you tomorrow night. God bless you. Thank you. Be good. Pray for us.